Good morning, church, and welcome to worship this day with the communities of Joyful Spirit United Methodist Church and Frazee United Methodist Church. And whether this is your first time, your 10th time, or your 100th time, whether you are a lifer in the communities of Wadena and Deer Creek and Frazee, Minnesota, where we're located, or you have found us online some other way, we welcome you, and we are glad that you are here with us to worship the living God in our midst this day. My name is Pastor Kevin Gregory, and it is a joy getting to worship with you all in this virtual space. A couple of announcements before uh, we begin. Both churches this morning are worshiping uh, online as temperatures in our areas have gotten into the 20s and the 30s. Uh, and with the possibility um, of snow, we uh, decided to move our, our, our services online. We're probably looking at the end of our outdoor services as fall starts to give way to winter. This online service will continue week after week, and we are continuing to explore other ways to be in community and connection with one another in this moment that we find ourselves in. We'll have a schedule for worship going forward for both churches very soon. Please continue to be in prayer for our churches and all churches as we continue to work out how to be the church in this time and in this place amidst this difficult moment. At Frazee, we have the opportunity to volunteer to be a part of distributing food to families in town uh, tomorrow on October 19th, alongside volunteers from Harvest Church in Bethlehem Lutheran. From 2 to 6 at Daggett Truckline, they'll be distributing food to households as part of the USDA's Farmers to Families program. Uh, volunteers are needed to help distribute boxes of food and shifts from 2 to 4 and then from 4 to 6. So if you're interested, uh, let me know and I can let Pastor Ryan at Harvest know that we have some folks that'd be willing to volunteer. At Joyful Spirit, we're continuing to collect monetary donations as well as donations of laundry detergent and liquid household cleaner, dish soap, toothpaste, uh, folding walkers, wheelchairs, crutches, canes, or other orthopedic supplies, as well as non-electric tools as part of the Minnesota Annual Conference's latest collection of supplies for the United Methodist Committee on Relief, or UMCOR. That was a lot of words. Uh, UMCOR is the disaster relief arm of our denomination, and these supplies will be collected and sent to those impacted by tornadoes recently in, in Iowa and hurricanes recently in the Gulf. If you'd like um, to donate, please uh, mail, uh, if you'd like to donate monetarily, please uh, mail that offering to the church's mailing address and designate it to UMCOR. Otherwise, we're continuing to collect those supplies for uh, the rest of this week. If you have questions, get in contact with uh, Kathy Harrison. There's much to be excited about and pray and think about as we enter into our worship this day. And so I hope that you are taking a moment in your space, in your home, uh, probably not outside on your porch this morning, um, in your car, in your dining room, in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever it is that you are for worship this day. We hope that you'll take a moment to enter into a mindset of worship. May we humbly approach this time ready to meet God's spirit, ready to be still, and ready to open ourselves to what God is saying or doing this day. And so I invite you, before we join together in the call to worship, to take a deep breath. And to take another one. And to take one more. To breathe in God's spirit, to be present here in this space. And may we join together in these centering words. Gracious God, may we seek you this day. May we find your grace in our lives and in the lives of others. May we be empowered to love and to be loved. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Immortal Invisible the piano recording of which is taken from our United Methodist Discipleship Ministries website. If you have a hymnal in front of you, which some of you may have, it's number 103 in the hymnal. Otherwise, the words will be in the video here for you. May we join together this morning in this hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise.
We'll move now into a time of prayers. We lift up our prayer concerns, those that we know and those that we don't know. And if there are joys and concerns that we're unaware of or that go unmentioned in this service, we hope that you'll take the time to leave a comment in the Facebook post for, for these services on either of the church's Facebook pages, to leave a comment in the YouTube uh, channel, in the YouTube video for this service, to email myself at the email address that you find listed here. Or for the Joyful Spirit folks, you can also email and contact our lay leader, Kathy Techham. That info will also appear at the very end of this service in the last slide of the video. Therefore, let us continue in an attitude and a spirit of prayer as we lift up those names of folks on our prayer list this day. And in phrase E, we want to continue to pray for all in our church family. We want to continue to pray for our community, for the Cornerstone Group and their ministry as they continue the process of renovating uh, the building that is now theirs. We want to continue to pray for all of those experiencing pain and discomfort and loss. We want to also continue to pray for Tyler King and his family as they continue to quarantine and for all of those in our community that continue to be impacted directly and affected by COVID. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And from Joyful Spirit, we want to continue to pray for our church as we take this next step forward in building our new church building. And we also want to be in prayer for Harold Reesberg, for Angie, for Gwen Thunberg, and for Myra Peterson at the loss of her sister Yvonne this last week. We also want to continue praying for Barb Neuschwander, for Lois Johnson, for Carol Seifer and Judy Malone, for Sandy and Barry Pratt, for Kathy Hill and Norma Lee, for Ellen Spear and Peggy Porta, Porter, for Landa and Terry Ackerman, and for Hannah Bartos. Friends, in the mix, though, of our joys and concerns and all the different ways that we have come to worship this day, may we join together and go to our God in prayer. And so let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather together online in this virtual space this morning as a community of believers, as a community of people wanting to be transformed and changed and challenged by the God of grace and mercy and love who calls us together. God, we give you thanks for the different means that we have to gather to be the church this day. And we pray that we might be invigorated to continue to connect in love and prayer for one another. God, as the days grow short and the nights grow long, as seasons change, as multiple crises continue, may we find rest and peace in your presence, and may we gift such things to other people. We pray this day, O oh God, for those in our communities that we've lifted up by name. We ask that your abiding presence be with them, that healing and comfort and peace might be their friends. We pray that you might also attune us to the needs of others in our communities, whose names that we know and whose names that we don't, that we might be bringers of peace and love and comfort to them as well. We pray for our counties of Wadena and Ottertail and Becker as cases of COVID continue to rise in all of them. We pray for essential workers, for teachers and nurses, for all of those that are in vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations that could contract this virus more easily. We pray for our state and other states in the Midwest, states like Wisconsin and the Dakotas, as cases rise all around us, that we might do what we can to keep others and ourselves safe. Oh God, we come together this day with much on our hearts and in our minds. Viruses, elections, natural disasters, recessions, so much continuing to happen in our country and beyond. May we in all things glorify you. May we be encouraged by your presence and emboldened to live out the words of this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we'll move now into our scripture reading and our message. I had my sermon all prepared and recorded uh, at the First Congregational Church in Wadena when I was up there on Wednesday, but when I went to put the uh, service together, uh, there were some uh, technical difficulties with uh, that video. 
and so it wasn't usable. So I'm recording my sermon again uh, in my home, and I'll be back in the sanctuary next week. But I invite you to hear this first reading this week. It's from Psalm 99. So I invite you to hear these words of poetry. And the psalmist writes, The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and holy name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. And they cried to the Lord, and the Lord answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this word. Thanks be to God. And our gospel lesson this morning comes once again from the gospel according to Matthew from the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 22. We pick up once again right where we left off last week. Jesus is still having a conversation with all of those who have gathered to listen to him in the temple. And the story goes like this. Then the Pharisees went and they plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. And so they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And then Jesus said to them, Now whose head and whose title is this? And they answered, The emperor's. And then Jesus said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him, and they went away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures have been read and your word has been proclaimed, we might hear with joy what it is you say to us this day. Amen. Well, friends, this seems like a heck of a time to be talking about taxes now, doesn't it? There's no avoiding it this week. Jesus wades into the political mess when asked what amounts to an extremely political question. And Jesus doesn't evade or defer. Jesus doesn't argue in bad faith. No, Jesus appeals directly to God. Jesus could have offered a fluffy answer, after all. He's probably pretty aware that all of the authorities in Jerusalem are bearing down on him. This moment in this story is one of the last few moments in Jesus' life that he will get to teach like this before he's arrested and tried and executed. But Jesus doesn't shy away. Not even in this, the last week of his life. He goes down speaking truth to power to the very end. And so we must follow. We must wade in the water a little bit as well. We must follow the uncomfortable paths that God lays out 
in store for us. Now they weren't trying to hide what they were doing. Matthew reports that the Pharisees and the Herodians were plotting. They were trying to entrap Jesus. They wanted to turn the crowds against him. They didn't want to debate or listen. They weren't trying to be persuaded or challenged. They just wanted to cause trouble. And so, as they have several times already in the gospel, they go picking a fight with Jesus. Except this time, though, there is quite an unlikely team-up. We have the Pharisees on one side, one of the sects of Jewish people in the region, teaming up with the Herodians, agents or political supporters of Herod, the ruler of the region where Jerusalem is located, given that power by Rome. So we have the religious establishment teaming up with the empire, the oppressed teaming up with the oppressor, hero and villain united to confront Jesus. This is like if Superman and Lex Luthor or Batman and the Joker decided to team up to take on someone more virtuous than either of them. This is not so much bipartisanship as it is betrayal. Rome is still ruling over Israel and the surrounding kingdoms. The empire looms large. But those in power, both religious and secular power, decide to try to snare Jesus. They try to trap Jesus. And they begin doing it with flattery that is really only thinly disguised by sinister intentions. Teacher, one of them, begins. We know that you are sincere. Which, of course, they don't. They think that Jesus is wrong and really kind of full of it. But they continue. And you teach the ways of God in accordance with the truth. But of course, that's a lie too. They aren't really buying what Jesus is selling. You show deference to no one, which is a grave insult. They probably really wish that Jesus would defer to them sometimes. They think that they're right, after all. You do not regard people with partiality, which really means you eat with sinners and you hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors and other Gentiles. And we really don't like that because we're better than those people. So already we're not off to a very good start. And after doing a poor job trying to butter up Jesus, they get to their question. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And they think that they've got him. Because either way, they think that they can skewer him in the court of public opinion. If Jesus says yes, it's lawful, well then that will put him at odds with many of the Jewish people who want to topple Rome, who want a Messiah that will ride in on a horse and lead them into battle against the empire, who think that violence can only be overcome by more violence. Likewise, if Jesus says no, it's not lawful to pay your taxes to the emperor, then that could be counted as a crime against Rome. They could arrest Jesus for sedition and likewise brand his followers as treasonous anarchists. They don't really care which answer that Jesus gives because they think that they can win, that they will have solved the problem. But Jesus, Jesus, of course, is the son of God. But not only that, Jesus is a brilliant public speaker. And he sees through this whole charade. Jesus knows that they're not looking for answers. They don't really want to know what he says. They aren't looking to have their minds changed. They just want to win the game. And so Jesus changes the rules of the encounter. He calls them hypocrites. And they know that they are. And he asks to see the coin, the denarius. And Jesus asks them whose image is on the coin and what title is ascribed to that person. The emperors, they respond. Tiberius Caesar Augustus. The coin they handed him had Tiberius's image on it and also declared that the emperor of Rome was the son of God. 
Since the first Caesar, the Roman emperors had declared themselves God, had declared themselves divine. They had said they were of divine lineage. And the coin, this coin that had Tiberius's image on it, was created in their image, in that image. It spoke of their kingdom, a different kingdom than the kingdom that Jesus spoke of. A different kingdom than the Son of God, Jesus, who was born not in a palace, but in a stable, whose power came not from money and privilege and succession, but from the God of all creation, the God of grace and mercy and love. This coin represented another kingdom, an earthly kingdom, a finite kingdom, a kingdom built on conquest and expansion, not a kingdom built on the love of one's neighbor whose borders are not of a nation, but which comes into existence each and every time that God's mercy and God's grace and God's love and God's justice are unveiled or made manifest in the lives of those around us. And so what does Jesus tell them then? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that that are God's. Jesus skirts the easy yes-no answer to their question. He tells them, of course you pay your taxes. You have a duty as a citizen of one kingdom to the things that mutually benefit your fellow citizens. But as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you must give to God what God wants, what God requires of you, as the prophet Micah in the Old Testament put it. You must do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And so the Pharisees and the Herodians, they go away with their jaws dropped. Because not only has Jesus provided a better answer, he didn't engage with their unequal argument. He didn't take the bait. He said, I don't have to converse with you. And that's not to say that what Jesus did was remain neutral. Jesus took a stance. He said, pay your taxes, do your duty, but also recognize that the kinds of things that God is after while grounded in this reality call us to something bigger and higher and more than just ourselves. And then likewise, this is not an excuse to withdraw. This is not Jesus telling us that we need to go be the kingdom of God off by ourselves somewhere and leave the real world to everyone else. Rather, this is Jesus saying, you live in the real world. And that means that you have certain duties and obligations to a number of different people and institutions. Do those to the best of your ability. And in doing so, you have the opportunity to demonstrate what it means to give to God what is God. What is God's? This dichotomy is a question of two images. The money created in the image of the empire. And you and I, and all of those around you, and all of creation, which have been created in the image of God. You do your duty as a member of the community of people that you find yourselves in. But what God requires of you is your heart and your soul, your mind and your strength. God wants all of your being. This is what is required. Now, I had a really hard time writing and finishing this sermon this week and recording it. <laughs> that was added, though. But I had such a hard time because I don't know what to say to you exactly that won't just add to the noise, as it were, of the election in our political cycle. What is there to say that would be constructive? Is there anything at all? And I think what Jesus is saying here in Matthew's Gospel is that as his followers, we are to be both engaged politically, engaged in our world, engaged in the things happening in our world, and also we are to recognize that the work and the world that God is creating is bigger than what we can accomplish. It's bigger than the election. It's bigger than political parties or partisan politics. God requires more of us. And it's really, really hard to hear and do anything within this moment. It's hard to do and think that 
with all of the things happening because it seems like all of the voices are so, so, so loud. But I think, more than anything, this passage is telling us that we cannot withdraw. We cannot look away. We may not always can watch the news or concentrate on the analysis or have the conversations that we need to have, but we can be present to God and to one another. And we can do our best to give to God what is God's, while also doing our duties amongst the people in our community. And we can pray. We can always pray. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, wrote about an election in his journal, which took place in 1774 in England. And Wesley writes of talking to some of those who were voting. He said, I met those of our society, of this Methodist society that Wesley was visiting, who had votes in the ensuing election, and advised them, number one, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. Two, to speak no evil of the person that they voted against. And three, to take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. I've seen these words posted around Facebook in the last few weeks, and I see the spirit of them in the statement that the bishops of the United Methodist Church released this last week. Bishops like our bishop, Bishop Bruce O of the Minnesota and the Dakotas Annual Conferences, where those bishops encouraged United Methodists in the United States to, and I quote, to vote and to protect free and fair elections and peaceful transfer of power. Jesus calls us to wade into the water, to work and to be worked on, to give ourselves to God and to our neighbors. In this turbulent time, may these be words of comfort, words of challenge, words of strength, and words of grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to end this time of worship, I invite you to receive this benediction. And then following, you will find ways to continue to contact and connect with us, as well as ways to continue to give of your gifts and your offerings in this season. But now, may you go forth. May you go forth this day to do as Jesus commands to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's. May you go forth to wade into the water, to show up when asked to show up, to be present when being present is what is required, and to be both challenged and comforted. May you go forth knowing that the God of grace goes with you and everyone here in this time and in this place. Amen. Amen.